30, 10, 35 or something, so we'll gallop through. Um, we need a mic. We'll start with the JLT. It's a race which uh, it's only been going seven years. Willie Mullins has won four renewals. He's got the favourite, I think, this year in invitation only. How do you see this race, Mark? Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier about that flow gas form um, being a little bit ropey and probably form that you'd want to, or I'd want to be taking on anyway. Um, invitation only comes from that. Monolly possibly possibly going to run in the JLT, probably not, but there are others as well. Um, I think this is probably going to be one of the weaker novice races at the festival, the JLT. You look down the list, I've mentioned already, I don't really like that flow gas form. Then you've got the likes of Finian's Oscar, who's had a, an up and down season, his jumping um, really doesn't look to cut the mustard. I think there's a good bet in this at a big price on Big Martra for Harry Whittington. Just a really likeable horse. He's been dead progressive in three chase starts this season. Won his first two. Um, he beat Surname at Newbury on his penultimate start. Surname's gone on to win a couple of grade two races since then. Big Martra was only receiving a couple, two pounds from him at Newbury. That was a really good performance. And then from a mark of 145 at Doncaster, Last time out, he wasn't. He, he was literally touched off right on the line by a, an older, more experienced horse. But he tries very hard. He jumped really well. He'll be having his first try at two and a half miles over fences, Big Martyr. I think that'll improve him. He's about a 16, 20 to one shot. I think he's a really good bet um, in a, an open race. Yeah, I wouldn't agree with Martin's assessment of the, the Leopardstone race. I, okay, they all finished pretty close to each other, but I think it was a really good race. I think there were some very good horses in the race, and I think that's why they all finished close up, that they're just a, a good bunch of novices. I think the Irish novices, especially um, from two miles up, are better than their British counterparts this year, and I think invitation only has been kind of laid out for this race. I thought at Leopardstown on the last day that, he, you know, I, I thought he was going to win for a long time, Monley possibly outstayed him. This intermediate trip is ideal for him. He's taken the jumping fences really well after a blip first time, and looks a much better chaser than Hurdler. And I think he's the one they all have to beat. So, uh, positive vote for, from Ireland for invitation only. And Martin fancies big march at a big price. Let's move on to the stairs hurdle. David, since we last saw Sam Spinner, there's been some change in the market. There's been some new arrivals and new dimensions added to this race. Do you still see this race as Sam Spinner being the chief contender? Well, I think he's the way that he won at uh, Ascot was so impressive. Uh, I think he's a horse that's got a tremendous amount going for him. He's a really likable horse, the way he goes about things. Uh, I think he's, it's going to be a different sort of test for him. Uh, and it's not necessarily one that will play to his strengths. And it will help him, I think, if we do get as much rain as they expect uh, and it does become a real slog for him. Um, I think he's he should be favourite but I can see a case for Super Sunday. Um, I think Yanworth, they've picked the right race to run him in but I couldn't entertain him. He's a horrible horse. He really is. I mean, he's, it's a, it's a shame he's not running in a in the JLT because he'd be a great place lay. Least favourite. I just think he's a horse that that's very hard to like because he he just doesn't do things in a way that you you want a good horse to do things. Uh, one horse I thought was perhaps a bit of a dark horse in the race, though I realise he's. He's not had the ideal preparation is Bacardi's, whose novice form last year stands very close to scrutiny. Uh, he tried chasing, that didn't work out. Uh, he was due to run in the Galmoy. Uh, he wasn't able to run because of a, a physical problem on the day. Uh, but I think he's a horse who's got the ability and he will be very well suited by stepping up to three miles. Double Bacardi's then, because I think he's the, the one remaining anchor in the race, and I've been quite keen in for a while. 
a rare good call on my part was that, well, after he, after he made mistakes first time over fences, there was always the chance, and then it soon emerged that Nichols Canyon would, was, was killed, wasn't he? Um, that they might reroute this, this very good staying horse to the stayers hurdle instead of persisting with a career over fences when he isn't really built for it and had made mistakes on both starts. The, the fact they ran him, in, we're going to run him in the Galmoy before he was withdrawn, certainly suggests that they two had shared the same opinion that hurdling was for him. And Clears makes the exactly right point with it. Not only does he know his form stand up well with beating Finian's Oscar over the wrong trip, it's the fact that he's so crying out for three miles, it's ridiculous. I mean, he's an out and out stayer. Um, if you watch that race at Punchestown back, Finian's Oscar leaves him for dead initially, but it's the ground he makes up and how strong he is at the finish. He leads late on. If that's not a horse that wants three miles, I've never seen one. Do really like Sam Spinner. I think he's just about the most likeable horse in training, and he'll take an awful lot of passing. But if there's a if there's a remaining angle in the race, a live one, I think it's Picard. He's on the basis that he's going to improve loads for the trip. Um. Yeah, I'm very much behind Sam Spinner here. It's one of my charity bets that we'll be coming to later on. Um, clearly, he's dead solid. I think it's pretty simple, this really, in that he's got the best form this season of the horses in this race, and it's the best three-mile form as well, and he's the strongest stayer. It's the stayer's hurdle. He's ridden in a, an aggressive manner that will make the race a proper test. Now, it hasn't always been that way. The likes of Solwit have run it, won it, and even in the years of big books, we often had set steadily run races, and the race developed into a bit of a sprint from the home turn. But with Sam Spinner in the race, and ridden in the aggressive manner that he usually is, I don't think it will be like that. It should be a proper stamina test. And for me, Super Sunday and Yanworth weren't stay. Um, the piece of form that they are mainly rated on, really, over hurdles, is the grade one at Aintree last season. Uh, where Yanworth won it, Super Sunday was second, Snow Falcon was third, and Taquan de Soy was fourth. Now, of those four horses that pulled clear in the Liverpool hurdle that day, none of them were really proven stayers over three miles. So only Snow Falcon of that four had actually won over three miles previously, and he won a good ground race in the August of the previous season. And on his previous start, he'd been beaten 20 lengths in a stayers hurdle, not getting home. I, essentially, as a piece of staying form at the top level, I don't think it's worth very much at all. Um, Super Sunday, his his best piece of staying form this season was when he was second to Apples Jade, but that was a slowly run race that he dictated. To me, he just isn't a stayer, and I think Sam Spinner will make the race a proper test and find out his stamina limitations. Um, so that's the sort of fr front three in the market covered. You've then got Apples Jade in the betting who's not going to run. Penn Hill, who we've not seen since last year's Cheltenham Festival. And then you know what I mean, Harry Lammy Serge, who Sam Spinner's already beaten. So it's a pretty clear form and standard pick for me in Sam Spinner. I think he's well clear. I think he's a really good bet at 5 to 1. Yeah, I'd echo what Martin said about Super Sunday. I think he's one to take on in the stairs order. Um, I think. As we were talking about there, Apple's Jade beat him at Christmas, and Apple's Jade outstayed him at Christmas. Uh, Super Sunday got to the front, looked like he was going to win. Apple's Jade galloped past him on the run in. I think three miles in a well-run race at Cheltenham, as it will be with Sam Spinner in the in the lineup, and possibly the new one as well. Um, I think he's vulnerable at this trip. I think if anyone is interested in betting in running, he could be one to lay in running because he travels really strongly through his races, and I think there'll be one, at least one, too strong from up the hill. But I wouldn't rule out Penn Hill that Mark touched on as well. If he gets into the race, he did win an Albert Barton last year. He was a classy horse on the flat. I know we haven't seen him for a while, but if he got there in, in the hole of his head, I think he'd have a decent each way showed. Do you think there's a chance with Sam Spinner that he's still being underrated because of his connections rather than if he was with Henderson, he'd be a much shorter price for this? I, I think he definitely is. And I mentioned the, the jump to time figures before, and there's something that I personally have a lot of belief in. I think they've been basically extremely good since the, the moment that they were introduced. And Sam Spinner clocked a time figure last time out of 166 when he won um, the long walk at Ascot. That's by a distance the best piece of staying form on time. 
um, that any of these, that any of any of the likely runners in the race have, have got. Um, he obviously beat Lammy Surge that day, who also clocked a good time, but he's had plenty of time to recover from what was a pretty hard race that day. Genuinely, my main concern is Joe Collar going too quick. It's a very easy track at Cheltenham to make you move a little bit too soon. There's a long run from the third last. Joe Colliver's, you know, he's not a top jockey, let's be honest. Um, he, uh, he's, he's done great on this horse, he really has. There's nothing wrong with him, but he's not got a lot of experience, shall we say, of riding big races under pressure at the very, the very main meetings, and he's got very little Cheltenham experience as well. So my main concern would be Sam Spinner basically making his move too soon, going too quick. I think if he doesn't, and he judges the, the fractions right, he's got absolutely everything in his favour to, to win the race. So uh, I think this is one of the championship races where we collectively feel that there's still uh, some edge in the price here with Sam Spinner, best form, strongest steer, and two positive votes for Bacardi's at a longer price. Now at this stage, 12 months ago, I kept very, very quiet when we talked about the Ryanair because I quite fancied Empire of Dirt, but these sharper minds either side of me were collectively right behind Ernde Sir, and he duly won a two to one, well back to two to one. He's the same price this year, Billy, for what just smells like a bit better race. Would you be so keen on him this time around? I would. Um... I think there's nothing to suggest that he's not the same horse this year that he was last year. We've only seen him twice, but he's won both of those races. He posted a, a big time form rating at Mallow on pretty much unraceable ground on his reappearance. And then was, was pretty good at Ascot. He did what he had to do, did it well. They've kept him specifically for this race. We saw last year good ground was no issue to him. And I think at this stage of his, of his life, two and a half is probably suits him better than two miles. He was brilliant in the race last year, and I don't see anything... Um, in what he has done this year to, to make me want to oppose him. He was brilliant in the race last year. Ruby was brilliant in the race last year as well. So the fact that he's coming back, I think, is all in the say's favour. A lot, I suppose, rests, doesn't it, on what Waiting Patiently does, because for me that's the sing that's probably the single strongest piece of form all season, the Ascot Chase, with a revitalised cue card, top notch, you being one of the standard setters in the division, left for dead in the straight. Awaiting patiently, he's been so well handled by the late Malcolm and now Ruth Jefferson, who's taken up the reins there. That was his biggest test, he passed it with flying colours. I mean, the horse was back on the bridle and Hughes was taking a pull in the straight. It was a pretty outrageous performance, but obviously there's a significant doubt about his participation. If we're going to hark back to last year, I just thought the prices, there may be some mileage and sub lieutenant to bounce back at 20s. Um, in the likelihood, or apparent likelihood, that waiting patiently won't go for the rider. I think he could potentially be under so if he does, particularly Q card now in the lineup to act as potential spoiler. Um, there's just a chance perhaps that sub lieutenant will revive for a return here. He's not hit the same standards this year, that's that's clear, but he was beaten just under two lengths in the race last season. He's a very sound jumper. If there's any value amongst the bigger prices, I, I had it as him, but. I'm just a bit aggrieved that waiting patiently apparently won't be going because he's a horse that I think the world of. On that, we come to a, another Ruth Jefferson horse in, in Cloudy Dream, who admittedly is a little bit of a dodge pot. I think he, he, he has a, a lot of seconds to his name, and it's probably not a coincidence that he does. He's a strong traveller, doesn't find an awful lot on off the bridle, puts his head to one side and needs the kid, kid glove treatment. But he was second to Altior in last year's um, Arkle at the festival. He has loads of ability, he's got a high cruising speed. I think the part of the reason, not the sole reason, but part of the reason they're not gonna run waiting patiently is because they have got another live each way chance for the race, at least in Cloudy Dream. I think the campaigning of the horse this season has been pretty poor, to be honest with you. He ran a screamer in the old run on his reappearance when Brian Hughes should have won on him, and he managed to meet trouble going to the final fence when he was I, he was trying to hang on to him, admittedly, as long as he could, and it, it just didn't work out for him because he met trouble at the inside in a, in a basically a two-horse finish, and he, he should have won that race, I think. They dropped him to two miles at Cheltenham next time, and then they've run him over three miles twice, and he just does not stay. He, just doesn't stay three miles he comes up there on the bridle two three out finds next to nothing but he'll be dropping back to two and a half in the Ryanair on better ground it'll be his optimum test in my opinion I think on that basis Cloudy Dream can run a career best 
and I think a sort of top price sixteen to one is a is a pretty fair each way price. Um, no negatives with the top end of the betting in Indusir, but he is is skinny enough this year for what I think is probably a slightly stronger renewal of the race. Uh, before we talk about the handicaps on the Thursday, I just want to ask Billy about Laurina because here we've got a horse who's odds on in the market for that race and not a horse who many of us are familiar with because we haven't seen that much of her, we haven't heard that much of her, but she's really strong in the market, notably strong in the market. So this is a race that Willie Mullins, we've only had two renewals and he's won them both. Is she in the same mould as Lamini and Len Stamps? On what she's done so far in Ireland, I think she definitely is, and she might even be better than Lamini in Let's Dance. She's only run twice for Willie. She won a maiden at Tremor, which is a pretty much a gap, but she won it by a street. And then they stepped her up into Graded Company in a, what looked a really hot race at Fairy House the last day. Now, the only drawback was that Cracker Dancer, who I thought was possibly the standard setter, didn't run a race. She didn't, um, you know, she was well beaten when she fell to out. That was a slight negative. But she wouldn't have beaten Lorena on the day anyway. Lorena absolutely tanked through the race and sprinted clear of a good mare called Alatrix, who came out a week later and bolted up in a, in a competitive mare's handicap at Leopardstown. It's very strong form. I think this is a really classy mare. I've a lot of time for Maria's benefit. She's done nothing wrong. She's been really well handled by Stuart Edmonds. But she's had a much harder season. Lorena's coming into this on the back of two runs. We have a large P behind her figure. We think there's way more to come from her. I think she's going to be a live contender in the, in the David Nicholson next year but I think she'd take this on the way. And for what it's worth, um, I heard today or yesterday that David Casey was at uh, one of these preview nights in Ireland the other week, David being Willie Mullins' assistant trainer, and he said Lorena is his banker of the week. So we've got... Oh, just one thing. Yeah, one of, our, one of our regulars with Dr. Chris Steele over there, Mr. Mr. Greyhounds, judge on Crush for 40 years, and he spent most of his life at Bellevue Dogs, watching a hare being tracked down by a superior being in the ground and I think that's what we're going to see this time around with Maria's benefit going off clear of the field and basically just drawing a performance out of Lorena which will be surely the best that we've seen in the brief history of this race. She looks to me like Annie Power but with scope. The engine is looks as big as, as hers was in my opinion but she's also got the physical capacity to make a chaser later on. She was just breathtaking the other week, as Billy was describing, and when you sit, then seen the run-up come out and win a handicap by the margin that, that she has, it gives you extra confidence in the form. I mean, I'd be staggered if this thing was being. Anything in the handicaps, David? Well, I will mention one in the pretense. Um, I was doing the jury this morning, uh, a thankless task, because we had a sub all weather card to, to work our way through, and I was on with Simon Walker, who's the senior jury, jury man, and he was much more interested in talking about the attempts, and was very keen on the chance of, wait for me, who's a horse who uh, hasn't had many goes at three miles, um, Philip Hobbs horse, uh, but he was going to bolt up one day at Chepstow over fences when he took a pearler of a 4-4 four, four out uh, on his first run at three miles. He qualified for this final uh, win canton on Boxing Day on desperate ground and uh, he's an unexposed horse at three miles against quite a lot of horses that, certainly the British horses, you know where you are with them. If there was one in that for me, it'd be a great view. Um, who, just to add to the McManus puzzle, I mean, he runs several in that race anyway, but he's entered this horse in the Leinster National at the weekend, so I have no idea what his plan really is. Um, but this horse made just a ridiculous amount of ground. It was probably 12th on the whole turn. It was a race in which not many got involved at Leopardstown the other week, and he ended up finishing second, making ground hand over fist. Qualified for this next time when uh, given a fairly considerate ride, so the job was done there. Just think he's a live one if he goes for this instead of running at Nace at the weekend. Want to give two for the Brown Advisory. I think this is where they're likely to go, um, but you'd be interested in the wherever. Mentioned briefly Vermor Van Early, who had the form with Last Goodbye. I think he wants two and a half miles, forcing tactics, uses jumping enthusiasm. And then Divine Spear, who scrambled home at Catterick then was really good at Ascot, thrashing them, and then got chinned at a really short price. 
when they ran him at another unsuitably sharp track. I think that was part of the long-term plan, really. That was his third run. He just needed it to get qualification for the race. The fact he was beaten meant that there was no suffering to his mark. And he just strikes me as a perfect type for this race where we've just scratched the surface of his ability. And the one time he had conditions that were more suitable were at Ascot when he was a wide margin winner and had the race won on the home turn. So I want to add him into the mix too. Yeah, just another prominent advisory. Um, Toddy East is very prominent in the betting and I'm sure loads of people would have seen him the other day as... At Leopardstone, really caught the eye. Um, of course, he won at the meeting last year. He's getting in off a reasonable mark, I think. Ground is important to him. Uh, he does like good ground or better. And if it if it does dry up, look, he's got an obvious chance anyway. Um, drier ground would, would make it even better. But in the full quality, the Kimmy the last race of the meeting, or the last race of the day, I should say. Uh, I'm quite sweet on a horse called Maldini. I was sweet on him for the race last year. He finished fifth. I didn't think he was Katie Walsh's greatest ride. I thought she gave him a lot to do on the day. I think they've been protecting his handicap mark all year since. They've run him in, in pretty hot races. He's been competitive for those being, you know, without ever really looking at winning them. But he hasn't had too hard races, too many hard races in the interim. Um, he stays really well. He's also in the four mile chase, but I think this is a probably a better fit for him. And off the same mark as last year, I think he'll go very close. Uh, we'll move on to the Friday now. Uh, and we'll kick off with the Albert Bartlett. Uh, not really a big one for trends and stats in terms of prices, but there's only been one favourite won the Alba Bartlett in the last six renewals, and I think it's significant in this sense because it's such a different type of race for these novices from what they've largely been tackling through the winter. Last year was a bit of an exception, it was steadily run, it was good ground, the flat horse, essentially the flat horse Penhill was able to win, but by and large this is a really gruelling test. And sometimes the form through the winter doesn't stand up when it comes to the Albert Bartlett itself. What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it's um, it's a race where it's easy to see why at the top end of the market, the horses at the top end of the market are there. Santini, he, he won well at the track last time. He looks he looks ready-made for going up to three miles. He should improve for it. Chef Desabo was impressive at Haydock as well. But I don't think either horse sort of sets a... A particularly high standard when we look at in comparison to such as Sam Crow, for instance, in the other novice hurdles. And I do think it's kind of right to have a pop at one at a big price. Um, I think Ennis Coffee Oscar could go well. He would, was good in the in the River Don. The pit, the form itself maybe isn't the strongest, but he looks like a thorough stayer, and we know that he's a really talented horse. He was second in the entry bumper last season. But the one I like even more than him at a very big price. He is very much a dark horse. He's Bally Ward uh, for Willie Mullins. He's, he's only run twice over hurdles so far in a couple of two and a half mile maiden hurdles and on bare form you wouldn't give him any sort of a chance at all. But he won a two and a half mile bumper last season in Ireland. He was sent off odds on. Clearly had a bit of a reputation going into the race and won by 16 lengths and he just looked like an, a, a, a copper bottom stayer the way that he won that day in the bumper. Um, and I was pretty impressed with him at Nace last time out. He, he, he travelled well, he got to the front approaching the second last, and he just dosed from the uh, uh, moment that he hit the front. He just didn't do a tap, really. Um, but he was always holding on. Like I said, the bare form and the, the time of the race, you wouldn't give him a chance in an Albert Bartlett. But I do think that he's a, a horse with a, a fair amount of ability based on that bumper win last season and he could take a big, big leap forward stepping up to three miles for the first time. I'm going to go Mullins likewise, but maybe not as copper bottom to stay as Bally Ward. But I certainly think even if three miles in a in what might be bad ground by this stage proves to be too much for Duke de Geneva. He certainly wants further than two miles. Was that better than Ronza? Um, um, he he was strongest at the finish by Sam Crow when he ran last time with Deloitte and the thing to note a, apart from that was that he's basically an open book so far as Mullins is concerned there just a couple of starts for him he ran one over two he ran once over two and a half dropped to two he was patently unsuitable but I just love the strength of his finish and whilst I'm not one to say, oh, if the trainer thinks this, then he must be right, if Mullins is willing to split his aces and leave next de destination around two and a half and think this is the more likely type for three miles, and the market suggests that's the case, 
then that will pretty much do for me. I think there's, there's some real untapped potential with a horse that Mullins has only had for five minutes, really. I think I'd like to mention Black Op again. Uh, if they do change the names and run in this rather than run in the uh, Ballymore. And the other horse I'd mention is uh, another Henderson horse. He's got two at the head of the market, but I thought Mr. Whit was really good when he won the Leamington at uh, Warwick. Uh, and I'm not sure he was in the same form when he ran at Musselburgh next time. I think it was a bit too quick. And Musselburgh, uh, I don't think, suited him nearly as well as Warwick did. And I'm sure stepping up to three miles uh, in a proper test will suit him really well. Um, just to throw one other, one other one into the mix, if you're not confused enough already in this race, um, it's a horse of Henry de Bromwich, it's called Chris's Dream. Um, de Bromwich has only had him for one run, he changed hands for 175 grand, which is small beer these days when you see pint of pinters being sold for 410 or whatever it was at Cheltenham last week. Um, he changed hands for that after winning a maiden order for Eugene O'Sullivan. He stepped up in grade for Henry de Bromwich last time at Clanmel over three miles now. I don't know if you can take the form at face value, but he won by 64 links, and if they'd gone round again, he'd probably have won by, you know, he'd, he'd have lapped some of the others. Um, he's a really strong stayer. This is another big step up, but if you can trust that Clan Mel form, which in fairness is probably a bit dodgy, he's, he is still very much a horse on the up. He does stay really well, and there'll be worse in the race than him. That was uh, morally won that, didn't he? That specific race before he finished second in the Albert Butler. So it's obviously a race and a routine that Henry de Bromhead knows well. Uh, we've, we've mentioned various horses there, trying to pick out a few. I think the general opinion is that it's a race probably to have a swing at the bat at rather than trust the top end of the market. Quite confusing, but probably less confusing the triumph hurdle where we still are. It's still like an open book with so many of these. Five of the top six in the betting are unbeaten for the present connections and they all bring different form lines, they all bring their own qualities and different characteristics. Cleas, have you got a starting point for what looks to be a really good triumph? It does, uh, and it's not a race I've had a bet in or particularly want to. I thought the one that might be slightly overpriced was the what appears to be the Henderson second string, and possibly because of the reputation of Apple Shakira, we have a dream despite his unbeaten profile, is available to back at around 10 to 1, which I think on the level of form that he's shown uh, is a bit bigger than he should be. Obviously, Apple Shakira has looked very good in winning her races. Uh, whether there's quite the depth of form to her performances, uh, I think he's open to question. I think it's the race of the week. I really do. Um, you've got, as Lynchy says, five horses, of the first six in the betting, are unbeaten for the current stable. You could pick any of those and say that in a more ordinary year, they'd probably be a short price, six to four, his favourite. Who's to quit to grab what Radishian's done? I know he's done it around Kempton, but he's shown loads of speed and seen his races out thoroughly. Um, and he also jumped a lot better when he won the Adonis. We Have a Dream's been foot perfect. I've been there for two of his wins and basically not been troubled um, but it's very unoriginal but maybe there isn't the same depth to Apple Shakira farm but there was a certain thing that happened before her first run in Britain which was in the preceding five minutes before the start she went from being clear second favourite behind Gumball to basically odds on so somebody knew and I suspect his initials might be JPM knew that this was a serious mare she's Justified short price on both runs since, but I actually thought she was she was really good last time. Some people were critical, but she conceded first run to look my way. He's maybe not a superstar, but he's a solid performer on the flight. who stayed extremely well. He'd given active valor a race first time out when they ran up at Newcastle. That horse briefly got away, but as soon as Apple Shakira had gathered herself, she ended up putting seven lengths between herself and a strong stayer on the running. I thought she was really good. And in this instance, I don't think the reputation lies. I think there's, there's something pretty serious here, as there should be. By Sandler Make of two to a and a half sister to, to Apple's Jade, the pedigree's there as well. 
I mean, I think there was definitely an element last time of Geraghty wanting to learn something, the way that he wrote it, that he was happy to allow the other halls to, to have first run, because he was confident that there was there was going to be what there was from Apple's Shakir. Uh, and so they will have learned a lot. Well, the equally handsome bearded chap over there referenced um, course form, didn't he? Equally handsome to you, not um, <laughs> And isn't it quite interesting that these contrasting profiles, Apple Shakira has gone to Cheltenham for her three stars and got this grounding that we'd like to see, whereas Radician, whether by circumstance or design, has ended up having his grounding around two miles at Kempton. So if you're going to split those two, it must be a thing in this horse's favour, Apple Shakira, that she's been to Cheltenham on testing ground three times. Not just shown that the track isn't an issue, but shown that she's very well suited by a stiff finishing her race. We've, uh, we've talked a little about the, the British contenders, but the Irish challenge is really strong. It comes from one stable, effectively. We have got far class for Gordon Elliott. He's the one of the top five in the betting who has been beaten, not once but twice. It's probably quite a tough task to go into the triumph as a maiden. But William Mullins sets a real pauser in terms of a form horse in Mr. Adjudicator. And despite that horse coming out and winning what's probably the best juvenile in Ireland this year, what strikes me is that neither Stormy Island nor Soldier, they didn't move in the market either. It's not as if their chances were diminished by Mr. Adjudicator. So I'm just hoping Billy can clarify this a little bit as to what might be the Mullins thinking behind his juveniles in the triumph this year. I would say they're, they don't really have a, a proper pecking order yet. Um, Willie just appears to have a very good bunch of juveniles this year. I think I'm right in saying that he has only won one juvenile that hasn't won so far this year. He's run about six or seven of them, and there's only one that hasn't actually won. Um, Mr. Adjudicator has, has really surprised me. He's not what you'd call an obvious jumper. He's by a horse called Camacho. Um, he doesn't appear to have a massive amount of scope, but he has taken the jumping hurdles really well. And what really impressed me at Leopardstown the last day was when Farclass got to him, uh, he battled back and he outstayed Farclass. And I thought Farclass looked like a horse that would get a bit farther than two miles. I thought Mr. Adjudicator was just a, a flat, a speedy flat horse, and I was surprised that he was able to battle back and beat Farclass, which would give me um, a, you know, a lot of confidence if I fancied Mr. Adjudicator. But certainly the most impressive uh, vis visual performance from a juvenile this year in Ireland has been Stormy Ireland. She absolutely destroyed an admittedly very moderate field at Punchestown, but she beat him by something ridiculous like 58 lengths, and she just basically ran away with Danny Mullins and just went farther and farther and farther clear. Um, she was still hard on the bright at the finish line. It took him ages to pull her up. She could be anything. She's only a little slip of a filly, but she'll be getting seven pounds now. I'm assuming they won't let her off in front like they did at Punchestown the last day, but she's clearly got a huge engine, and you know, if Ruby decided to get down to 10-7 for her, I think it'd be highly significant. But you also have Saldier thrown into the mix. He was group class on the flat in France. He won Again, a moderate race at Gordon, but won it really well, and you know the, the chat about him afterwards was very positive. So I think Willie's got a strong bunch, and I think a lot will depend on, on what Ruby decides to ride in the race. Uh, I think, obviously, there's lots of different opinions. That's the nature of these horses, but they're unbeaten, they're still developing. It's hard for us to analyse them and to evaluate them. But one thing's for sure is that, thinking back to the champion hurdle, Bouvet, uh, if he returns next year, isn't going to have things so easy because there's a whole clutch of really classy juveniles and this triumph hurdle, it, it stands out from most triumphs in terms of the strength in depth and I think it's probably going to be the race of the week looking ahead to the future and not just on the day as well. But the race of the week for most people is obviously the Gold Cup, where my bite is favourite. It's sort of... Um, sure. Yeah, quick show of hands, because he, I don't know, he's quite a divisive horse, isn't he, because of his nature and what he did last year. Clearly, in ability terms, it was pretty freakish, but who couldn't touch him because of those doubts? And who, on the other hand, thinks that he's, the market isn't factoring in enough just how good he's been and, and the ability he's shown? If you think yes, put your hand up. If you think no, put your hand up. What we've learned is, is leave Jamie to the presenting <laughs> so if you couldn't back my bite because of his flaws the his obvious flaws please raise your hands now right that's 40 percent that's interesting 40 percent 
What's your view on that? Are we over, are we concentrating and over focusing on his flaws in, in terms of that winning sequence? Um, look, I, I was very negative about him. Well, not very negative. I, I couldn't have backed him last year at a, a relatively short price because I thought he was a bit of a dog. And I think, to be honest, he pretty much showed us in a, in, in, in a way that he was by trying to throw the race away. He's obviously a really talented chaser, so there's no doubt about that. The reasons I would take him on personally this season are, are kind of partly to do with that attitude, partly to do with a slightly suspect stamina, I think, uh, in a Gold Cup. It, it will be the most severe race that he's ever run in. I think, moreover, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take him on because I don't think he's got the best form. The King George, to me, looks like a can of beans. He beat, he beat double shuffle at length. And he was impressive, he was value for extra, etc, 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 but it wasn't a particularly strong King George, in my opinion. I think a, a rag finished second, a thistle crack pretty much gone at the game, he was still in fourth. And I think taking on sizing John, Native River, Road to Respect, even our Duke, those horses, I think it will be a much tougher race for Mike Bite. So for those reasons, at the prices, I'm more than happy to take him on. Um, I think Sizing John has got the best form over the last 12 months. Um, not only the Gold Cup, but also this season when for me, in the John Durkin over two and a half miles, he came back and looked like a better horse, if anything, than he did last season. And I think it, for me, part of sort of, if you're gonna win money on, on backing horses, if you're gonna get value on horses, sometimes you have to look away from their last performance and you have to be quite forgiving if you like of their most recent start on occasions and it can lead you to getting a, a significantly better price and a value price about a horse and I think this is a prime example of that with Sizing John in that the market is focusing on the fact that he was a disappointment in the Christmas chase but we know full well that he, he didn't give his running that day. And if you look back to the John Durkin, he looked, like I say, in my opinion, better than he's ever looked before. The John Durk, sorry, the Christmas chase was the quickest he's ever turned out in a race before. He was 18 days on the back of the uh, on the back of winning the John Durkin. He put up a really big performance on the clock in the John Durkin. He ran to a time form time figure that day of 168. So mm -hmm. even if visually it might have looked like a race that was easy for him. If you're going to go to that level of performance, you are going to take something out of yourself on heavy ground. Um, like I say, 18 days on from that was the quickest he's ever turned out in his life, on the back of one of, if not the best performance of his life, potentially. I think he just literally just found it too quick, and it is a genuine excuse. He goes to Cheltenham, a fresh horse. I think they've done the right thing missing the Irish Gold Cup with Sizing John last month. Um, and you can't really knock the way that he did it last season. He was really impressive. He travelled best. He jumped best, I think. And he's got the least flaws of, of all the fields. So I, I think he should be a fair bit shorter than sixes. I've got a question for you. If it's heavy ground, will he stay? I don't think it'll be heavy ground. <laughs> <laughs> if it's significantly more testing ground than last year, is stamina the question? <laughs> I, honestly, I don't really think it is, to be honest. I, I thought he saw his race out really well last year. When he won at Punchestown, uh, it was a tight finish between him and Jack Adam, but he pretty much outstayed him. And every time we've seen him step up in trip, I, I've got to be honest, 18 months ago, if he'd have told me there was Gold Cup pass, I'd have laughed at you. I didn't think he was, but every time we've seen him step up in trip in his career, he's got better. He's, he's just kept on improving. Um, so I don't, I don't think it'll be an issue. But to be honest, I, I don't think it will be like a, you know, a, a bottomless ground gold cup. So, yeah, I, I think he's a really good price. I do. I think that as uh, tied into the fact of what I say about the recency bias, if you like, involved in the market, is is um, Native River's price in comparison to Sizing John. In that most bookmakers have Native River at a shorter price than Sizing John. Last year, to me, he beat him fair and square, and Native River hasn't had the ideal preparation, really, himself, in that he was injured for the first half of the season. And although he comes into this year's Gold Cup on the back of an impressive win at Newbury, he did exactly the same last year as well. 
So, and, and sizing John was too good for him that day. So, like I say, for me, sizing John should be, if not favourite for the race, he should certainly be close to being favourite for the race. Yeah, I think that's a very fair comment. I think there's no reason that, I think sizing John should be favourite. I think he was the undisputed king of this division last year. Um, he completed a treble that, that I don't think any horse had done before. He was the best staying chaser in, in training. He did look really good in his return, and I think his run in the, in the Christmas chase, as it's called now, I think it was a bit of an afterthought. Um, Jessica Harrington said straight after the John Dorkin that she wasn't going to run him at Christmas, because the initial, the initial thing was run him in the King George, and she ruled that out straight away, and then I think just as an afterthought, because he'd won so well, and obviously must have appeared in good form at home that they ran him in the, in the Christmas chase. But if you remember that Christmas chase, like he beat Jackie Dam and the John Dorkin, both of them bombed out in the Christmas chase. I think they just bottomed each other out in that race. I'd be very willing to put a line through it. And if he bounces back to the sizing John of last year, then he's going to take all the beating. Um, I do think the supporting cast from Ireland is very strong this year. Uh, Jessica has another live contender in our Duke. He run away winner of the Irish National last year. The one negative with our Duke is that on his last two runs in particular, he has made notable mistakes at inopportune times. Um, it possibly cost him in the Irish Gold Cup. Uh, he made a mistake about two or three out, I think. Uh, would have got very close only for that. And again, at Gordon last time against presenting Percy, he got away with a bad mistake that day, but he won't get away with a bad mistake in a Gold Cup. You have Kilolta Vic, who probably would have won the Irish Gold Cup, but for falling at the last. Um, I'd say a horse of immense, immense talent. I'd say he's got a huge amount of ability, but obviously he's been off the track a long time. He's only had three runs over fences, and that bit of inexperience is going to count against him, we think. Also, the step up to 3-2 is a bit of an unknown. And... You know, you've got as well the likes of Road to Respect, who has gone from strength to strength. He's just got better and better since he's transferred to Noel Mead. Came good at this meeting last year, and the drier of the ground gets the better for him. I think his form is a little bit below the level required to win this race, but he's certainly a live contender. As is Total Recall, who of course won the Hennessy, as it'll always be known, at Newbury. Um, you know, well handicapped as it turned out, and absolutely thrown in in the handicap order last time at Leopardstown, but he's improved hand over fist. I think there's no doubt that Willie Mullins is targeting Grand National Adam or with him. But he stays really well, he's a horse on the up and you know if they do go really good gallop and it turns into a slog, he'll come up the hill better than most and he's a, a decent each way shout at about 20 to 1. I, I think the size of John argument, of course he, he was the pick of the staying division last season, but I just don't think it was a strong strong year for that um, they're like tallest dwarf syndrome isn't it I mean, what, you are the best of that bunch but is it sufficient to make you that far ahead of the new crowd and the new crowd this time around it includes a few that, that Bill's mentioned but the one that I really like is our Duke because I think he's got the most ability of these um, he obliterated them in, at Fairy House in the Irish National he then reappeared and just ran a lifeless race first time out at uh, Down Royal. That clearly wasn't him. Was treated for a kissing spine apparently. Um, then came back and as Bill said, I mean, it, the race wasn't over. In fact, he gave you a glimmer that he might be back prior to sprawling on landing at the second last. The fact he's then come out soon afterwards over the wrong trip, giving seven pounds to present in Percy and still managing to overcome a terrible mistake that would have put other horses on the floor suggests to me that all his ability is still intact and what he did in the Irish National was that of a, I think, the best stayer around and I'm hoping that he confirms it. My one niggle is that I think he's better when, pa when power rides him, I think he's better being pushed into fences and having his mind made up for him whereas he's not really Noel Fahili's style. I almost wish he'd have let Noel Fahili ride him the other week over two and a half and let him get his eye in on the horse rather than that seemingly being a reaction to the performance and oh now we'll change our minds but I think Fahili's a brilliant jockey one of the very best around but it's my own equivalent I think I think in terms of ability this is the best horse in the race and nine to one is it is a value price about that nine to one's a terrible price this, <laughs> this won't be winning uh, I mean, he was he was being fair and square at, at Leopardstown. He, he made a mistake there. He made a mistake when under no pressure at Gorham in a two and a half mile race against a horse that's a three mile plus horse. Is he not three mile plus horse? Well, he is, but the form's well, not, not the form's not worth. A fat? Well, it's. Well, it's a I mean. It, 
Mike Bite's the best horse in the race. He's he's never looked like, apart from when he's looked wayward, looked like getting beaten. The King George, he was never going to be beaten at any stage of that race. And I know he's been Double Shuffle, who's a, a rag, but Double Shuffle has come and picked up the pieces after the horses that have tried to beat Mike Bite have got seen off. Oh, yeah, visually, like the way he, obliter he basically obliterated them in the King George and, and broke Crystal the Maze, I like to say. But, as you say, Double Shuffle is there. We can't just ignore that it's there. We can't ignore that it was a poor RSA last season. He won't get away from them like he did 12 months ago. And if he behaves as he did on the run, and he's now done on both visits to Cheltenham by, by getting wayward, then he just won't, he's not that far clear of this field, particularly in a race that could be a thorough test of stamina to get away with those antics. But didn't he look much more straightforward in the King George and also when he beat Froden uh, out of sight at Sandown? He was better at Aintree as well when he was properly tackled, but again, that was that was him scrambling home from Whisper on that occasion. I just don't think there's the depth to his form that matches up to... Yeah, there's an, there is definitely an air about him that he's got this freakish ability, but is that really reflected in the form book? I'm not sure. We should. I can talk about it. Well, I mean, he was. He's got a really progressive, definitely red. He's got a tremendously progressive profile. And he was very good, very professional, very solid in the Cots world. And if it does become a slog, then he's a horse who will benefit from that. Yeah, I was going to say, if, if it comes up heavy ground, he's got. Um, he's he's going to have everything in his favour, definitely red. No, no, I didn't. I did. Yeah. I don't think it will come up that ground. But um, no, definitely, Red's a, he's a worth an honourable mention, if nothing else. Anyway, I think he has got a solid each way chance at a big price. He's sixteen to one. To be honest, we we talked about such as our Duke, um, Native River, a little bit horses like that. I think he's got every bit as good a form as them from the Cots World. He's proven himself at the track now, and I think he'll run well in the race. Uh, anything else around the Good Friday for the handicaps? Captain Hurdle. Uh, what else have we got? Fay and Val in the Grand Annual, if the ground is somewhere near good, good to soft. Uh, he's a horse who uh, has slipped back in the weights, having uh, had excuses really for his races this year. Um, he ran really well in this race uh, 12 months ago uh, and I'm sure he'll have been trained particularly for it. Yeah, a couple of like handicaps on Friday in the county hurdle. I hope she runs in the county hurdle. She's in a few times during the week. Uh, affiliate Willie Mullins is called Lagos to Vegas. Um, she's been much improved since Willie got her. And I thought she ran a really nice race with Gordon on unsuitably heavy ground in the Red Mills trial hurdle a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she would have gone close enough, but for a mistake, two out and, and wasn't given a hard time. She improved a lot in the flat. She was only just touched off in a listed race in the flat in her final run for for Willie Mullins last season and she's won a couple of handicap hurdles. I think this sort of scenario is ideal for her. Uh, big field handicap, they go a good gallop and she'll get up the hill, she stays a lot farther than this. I think she's still on a reasonable mark and she'll run well. And in the Martin Pipe, again, it's very hard to know what's going to run in the race, what's going to get in, but I think Willie has a horse in the race called Deal Death through Val. I doubt he'll get into the Coral Cup, he's only rated 136, but he won a pretty much a nothing now this hurdle or maiden hurdle that Tremor uh, took him all day to win it but Tremor wouldn't be his track he's too big for Tremor ran an absolute cracker in what used to be the Ladbroke hurdle at Leopardstone beaten by a horse of, of Charles Burns who was probably thrown in down the bottom of the handicap came from a long way back I think that was a really good run I think the step it back up to two and a half will really suit him and I think there's a bit of scope on his handicap mark so deal that through Val in the Martin Pike one handicapper for me, uh, Delta Work for Gordon Elliott. Um, I don't know whether he's going to run in the Martin Pipe, he might do, or the Coral Cup, he's entered in both races. I think he'll run in one or the other, but he's a horse who absolutely hosed up off uh, on good ground in a maiden hurdle last year at Punchestown. He's been, typically, it's, it, Gordon Elliott's had plenty of these horses win handicaps at festivals in, in recent years where they've been playing their trade on heavy ground through uh, in Ireland and really 
less testing conditions suit them better and Delta work his last three runs have come over three miles in the mud and he doesn't get home really he's travelled well on each occasion hasn't stayed I would imagine they'll be dropping him back in trip for either the Coral Cup or the Martin Pipe conditions will be a little bit less testing and I think he'll show improved form so um, like I said Delta work I don't know which race he'll run it but it's worth making a note of I think he'll improve a bit just one final question for the gentleman in the front is which short price favourite through the week would you bet against? Who's the short price horse in the week who you think is the most vulnerable? Who wants to start with that one? Anyone? We can't even get one part. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, a little bit controversial, I'm going to say Altior as, as the first one for the reasons I explained a little bit earlier. Um, Number two. I'm trying to think of all the short price favourites to be honest as we're going through it, but no, not Apple Shakira. She's not short, is she Apple Shakira? I won't be dead against her. Well if she's short enough then I'll say Apple Shakira just for you. <laughs> for David's benefit I'll go for my bike and watch him hang into the Guinness of <laughs> Me or my bride? <laughs> <laughs> you were already there, you didn't need to Oh, wait, a second one. Um, let's quickly think on our feet. Second one, second one. Um, under so, no, I'll go for one of those. One of those mulling type horses in the bumper. Let's get AC Milan home, land the charity a bit. And a big winner for Anthony Honeyball. If, if you remember a few years back, had the runner up Riga Lanco. Uh, speaking of charity bets, our. Selections will appear on that screen. Have a look at them, take a note of them if you need them. But oh, it's 20 to 11. Um, if you've got any, oh, yes, sir. Uh, are we not discussing the fox hunters? <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you think? No, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> We've got donkeys ridden by farmers, and you want to discuss that? <laughs> Uh, so if if that's it for anyone, honestly, we so appreciate your patience, we so appreciate your support. It's a privilege to have such a full audience and respectful audience. Thank you so much. Hope you back some winners and hope we all come back here again next year. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm.